So please welcome Dr. Lionel Milgram. <clears throat> Let's just start with um, a brief history of medicine. I mean, very brief and very uh, biased. And this was taken off the wall of a shop called Neil's Yard in London, which sells all sorts of homeopathy and products to make your skin look good and all that kind of thing. So, circa 2000 BC, eat this root. 1000 AD, that root is heathen, here say this prayer. 1850 AD, that prayer is superstition, drink this potion. 1940 AD, that potion is snake oil, swallow this pill. 1980, that pill is ineffective, take this antibiotic. 2000, that antibiotic is artificial, eat this root. <laughs> so... <laughs> hey, we're just getting warmed up here, you know. Okay, now, Peter showed a slide like this previously, but I think it's necessary to actually emphasise the, dif the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. In normal language, if there is such a thing, the two terms are synonymous. But in biomedicine, no. Efficacy means um, how well a drug procedure works in an ideal or controlled setting, like, for example, a randomised controlled trial. <clears throat> And that measures the drug performance in a limited time and usually under tightly controlled conditions. When we look at effectiveness, what we're looking at is how well a drug procedure, or drug or procedure rather, works in real life. Um, and that considers how, drug the easiest, uh, how easy it is to use and over time and what kind of side effects crop up over time. You very rarely get side effects from a randomised controlled trial because the uh, period of the trial isn't generally long enough. And that means that efficacy is a much narrower def definition than effectiveness and that might not include side effects. <clears throat> so let's have a look at RCTs. Um, in biomedicine, the efficacy of a drug is usually thought to depend on its pharmacological action which now that we're sort of, you know, into the 21st century and we know a bit about uh, biomedicine and biochemistry at that level, it's the causal interaction of drugs with cellular receptor sites. Incidentally, paracetamol, which is probably one of the most successful painkillers in the world, we don't actually know how it works, really. We don't know how it works, really. And yet it's one of the biggest selling drugs on the planet. <coughs> I'll come back to something like that in a moment. The randomized controlled trial is the gold standard for gauging efficacy, not effectiveness. So how can a substance diluted out of existence apparently exert any effect, let alone a therapeutic one? Um, and so the attitude is towards homeopathy, it shouldn't work, therefore it cannot work. So any reported effects of homeopathy must be, at best, a placebo response, at worst, skullduggery, quackery, and we're all guilty of being witches. Well, I'm not a witch, because I'm basically a bloke, so, you know, I can't be a witch. Uh, and the result is that homeopathy actually ends up getting more severely tested via random randomised controlled trials than conventional drugs. If the trial comes out positive, and you heard from Peter this morning, that there's quite a few trials that actually show a positive effect, then the call is for more trials. If the trial is negative, then of course that damns homeopathy to petition for infinity. Uh, and yet, we have a drug like Prozac, which can be effective. I've got one or two friends, and they're friends because, you know, they're on Prozac because they know me. Um, that, uh, yeah, it works for them. You know, you can't take it away from it. It works there. They're actually calmer, more beautiful people. Again, not through knowing me. Uh, but it's a drug that earns billions for Big Pharma. But in trials, it's been shown to be no better than placebo. It's true. There's the paper. So there's hypocrisy going on here. 
So there are many trials that show a positive effect for homeopathy in a variety of conditions. But let's actually unpick that. Let's deconstruct it. What's actually going on here? Let's look at this. Um, this is data mined from about 156 RCTs, and it's on the British Homeopathic um, um, web website. 41% of trials for homeopathy show a positive effect, 7% a negative effect, and 52% inconclusive. So if you just looked at that and say, wow, yeah, homeopathy works. But let's have a closer look at the other side, which is when we look at trials of conventional medicine, 44% show a beneficial effect, 7% are harmful, 49% are inconclusive. Look at the coincidence of those figures. The only thing, if you're being objective, Mr. Journalist at the back there, <laughs> that you can conclude from that is that contrary to what detractors, otherwise known as skeptics, detractor is a nice word for skeptic, I can think of worse ones actually, but anyway is an objective reading of the clinical trial data shows that the efficacy of homeopathy is no better or worse than conventional medicine. So rejecting homeopathy is false and biased as many conventional drugs procedures should be similarly rejected, but are not. That's the take-home message. You can go for your lunch now if you want. <laughs> OK. So... Is the RCT, the randomised controlled trial, is it this gold standard, this golden calf that we all worship? Is it worth it? When 50% of the trials are inconclusive, what an incredible waste of money. Do you know how much it costs to do a trial? Especially when you're in phase three of a drug. You're looking at millions. I'm not a physicist like Alex. I'm a chemist, which means I'm of lower intelligence, actually. But uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I actually started a, an anti-cancer um, company at Imperial College some years ago uh, and the treatment works and we can't get any um, funding for it, obviously. But the further you go in developing a new drug or a new procedure, the more expensive the trials become, especially, especially when you get into trying to treat humans. So if 50% of the trials are inconclusive, is there something wrong with the RCT's implicit assumptions? Well, let's have a look at those. Just a minute, can I uh, just grab my water? Where's it gone? Oh. Here. Excuse me, comfort break. Ah, better. Right. So the healing process during treatment is an additive effect, an additive effect. We'll come back to the meaning of that in a moment. The natural course of the disease, the non-specific effects of the therapeutic intervention, for example, the consultation, and as we know, the um, homeopathic consultation is absolutely 100% superb. The specific effects of the treatment, that is the drug or whatever. Now, additive means that these effects are separate from each other and do not affect each other. And there's a reason for doing that. What is the placebo response? That's the placebo is not supposed to have any effect at all, so or any specific effect. So in this arm of the trial, what you see is an additive effect of the natural course of the disease, the non-specific effects of the therapeutic intervention. So once you've done that, it becomes dead easy to get the treatment effect by this simple arithmetic procedure. Take B away from A. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 minus 1 plus 2 gives you 3. Amazing. But the trouble is, the assumption here is that the specific and the non-specific effects don't affect each other. In reality, because we're human beings, we're not washing machines or guns or rockets or things like that that work mechanically. We're human beings. They interact with each other. They're intimately correlated. Now, as soon as I hear the term intimately correlated, I think of entanglement, quantum entanglement, mm. as generalized from the use of quantum theory. So this is where the talk gets weird, OK? Prepare for weird. If entanglement is necessary, 
perhaps the effect of the RCT methodology could be to break that entangled state during the therapeutic intervention. Consequently, if entanglement between patient, practitioner, and remedy is a necessary condition for such interventions, then the more rigorously the RCT methodology is applied, the less likely such trials should actually demonstrate the efficacy of homeopathy. Or, let's keep this general, the efficacy of any treatment. Any treatment. Okay. So let's talk about quantum entanglement. It's a bit difficult. I'm not even sure I understand it myself. But, as Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist in uh, physics, naturally, said about quantum theory, anyone who says they understand quantum theory probably doesn't understand it at all, essentially. So I'm in good company. So when photons, electrons and molecules interact and then separate, if you look at before the interaction, we describe each particle by its own quantum state, and that is in terms of a mathematical entity called a wave function. If you want to understand wave functions, you've got the sea out there, so don't have your lunch. Go to the side of the sea, drop a couple of stones in the water, and watch how the waves interact with each other, and you will be an expert on quantum entanglement. <laughs> <clears throat> it's worth your lunch, believe me. Now, after interaction, the member of each state, uh, so, sorry, the, each member of that interaction, we still describe them individually as a, in a definite quantum state, but we also have to include a term that describes their holistic uh, relationship relative to each other. And it's that term that creates what's called a superposition. Because we're describing each of these things in terms of waves, waves can be added together and subtracted. When they add together, they superpose, okay? Right, now, that means when we make a measurement on one element of that um, entangled pair, we know something about the other element instantaneously. And it doesn't matter how far they've separated, they could be at opposite ends of the universe. We'd still know that if we've measured the spin of an electron like that, then the spin of the other electron at the opposite end of the universe will be like that. We know it instantaneously. In other words, faster than a signal of light can transfer between them. This is quantum entanglement. Okay? It's weird. Now I'm going to try and tell you why it's weird. <clears throat> okay, that's what I've just said. So my question is, could this form of entanglement, which obviously applies to subatomic particles, could it actually apply to us as human beings? Hmm, what an interesting idea. Except that this idea has met with contempt from homeopathy's detractors. If you put my name into Google, you'll see loads of trolls and uh, skeptics on there calling me out for all sorts of idiocy, which is fine. You know, unfortunately, it's a free universe we live in, and I do not own an AK-47. I wish I did. <laughs> okay. Now, what we have to do then is understand where they are coming from in terms of their understanding of quantum theory. This is because in orth the orthodox interpretation of quantum theory, that's based on what we call a realist ontology, okay? which is that the universe is separate from us, existing whether we do or not. Now, if you read my T-shirt, it says, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be dis discovered. That was a quote from Carl Sagan. In other words, he thinks it's out there. Well, no, actually, it's all in here. Now, that means it's a contradiction, and I believe we should wear our contradictions, okay? Right. Now, this is what's called strong objectivity. We all buy into it. You know, you wake up tomorrow morning, this place is still here. It didn't disappear while you were asleep. Okay. So this strong objectivity effectively combines any discussion of quantum theory to the realm of the incredibly small. <clears throat> The orthodox interpretation of quantum theory assumes that a quantum state's mathematical formulation describes its objective reality. 
Fortunately, this view has been actually challenged by a chap called Anton Zeilinger in Switzerland, who's done some amazing work in the last 10 years. And he says that um, the math mathematical description of a quantum state is only it can only represent what can be known about it. Right? Now, the French physicist Bernard Despagnier, he goes even further, based on the quantum entanglement that Zeilinger has actually seen in his experiments, he concludes that we do not live in a strongly objective reality. So at the basis of quantum physics is this notion that this reality, this objective reality that's out there, that exists whether we do or not, doesn't. It's not that objective, which is really quite weird. But, you know, we all sort of fly on the backs of people who come before us, and I'm quite happy to do that. So, in Zeilinger's interpretation of quantum theory, information takes on a far more fundamental meaning than any notion of objective reality. And for something to be known, there has to be a knower. Right? So at the level of consciousness, subject and object are intimately correlated with each other, i.e. entangled. Don't take my word for it. Max Planck, the father of quantum theory, in his later years, he got really philosophical. Science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature, and that is because we ourselves are part of nature and therefore part of the mystery that we're trying to solve. Okay, so this information approach allows quantum theory's principles to be generalized outside its normal na narrow confines of the subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, etc., to macroscopic systems. And so maybe we can start using quantum theory, or at least the discourse of quantum theory, the mathematical discourse, to actually use it in more metaphorical contexts. And essentially, that's what I've been doing for the last oh, far too long. Um, and in fact, it's proven relevant in things like non-physical non phenomena, such as the dynamics of interpersonal relationships. There are papers out there on this. It's, it's really quite fantastic. Okay, now, in orthodox quantum theory, it's completely ridiculous to consider the notion of entanglement between a macroscopic entity such as a remedy, which is derived from a material substance, and a totality of symptoms, we're now talking homeopathy, which is an idea generalized from one individual's observations about another. Would you agree with that? Say yes, Lionel. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay, but that's because the orthodox interpretation of quantum theory is based in this realist ontology, the strong objectivity. And so you must present such a false dichotomy if you're stuck in that paradigm. But that paradigm disappears when you consider that both the remedy and symptoms are actually sources of information. And we know remedies are sources of information because we have repertories and materia medici. They're sources of information, they come through us. Oh, that's us, not me, you know. <clears throat> so with similar ontologies based in information, they're now quite capable of being entangled. And who's doing the entangling? The practitioner, perhaps, during the therapeutic process. Okay, so the therapeutic interaction. And when I'm talking about the therapeutic interaction, I'm not just talking about homeopathy. What I've begun to realize over the years is this applies to everything, or could apply to everything, including conventional medicine. <sighs> Protagoras, fifth century BC sophist philosopher, before people like Socrates and Plato. Man is the measure of all things. That's an amazing statement. Think about it. Man is the measure of all things. And then Bishop George Barclay from the early 18th century. To exist is to be perceived. It's coming from the same place. To exist is to be perceived. How do we know we exist unless we, our existence is acknowledged by other people around us? I mean, if you ignored me now, I'd disappear. Just like that. Puff of smoke. 
<clears throat> of course, the big Zen koan of them all, does a tree crashing in a forest make a sound when no one is there to hear? Has any, anyone ever sort of like bothered to really get to the grips with that one? More to the point, is it still real? Well, of course it is. Just because it's going on up here doesn't mean it's not real. I think what we've got to get away from is the idea of reality being something outside of us which exists whether we do or not. It's still real. It still hurts if the tree falls on you. It kills you, actually, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, you've probably all heard of James Tyler Kent. Yes? Anyone not heard of him? <laughs> Any homeopath who hasn't heard of him? And he said in his lecture 29 on idiosyncrasies, a remedy is homeopathic when it cures the case. That means that a bottle of pill sitting on a shelf in a pharmacy, on its own, unprescribed, is not a homeopathic remedy. Something you might like to consider, journalists at the back, what the true meaning of the word homeopathy means. Similar suffering, homeopathy. Or, put it another way, this is rewriting what Kent meant in my terminology, Remedies may be considered homeopathic when their preparation and potency becomes by prescription entangled with the therapeutic interaction between the patient and the practitioner, the triadic totality curing the case. Makes it sound a bit like a placebo effect, doesn't it? Well, this is the essence of PPR, what I call PPR entanglement. Okay, so how are we doing for time? How am I doing for time? No, don't look at the paper, that just says five. <laughs> so, we use a mathematical formulation uh, based on three-way quantum entanglement, um, and I tend to think of this in terms of certain kinds of shapes, and this is when it gets very, very weird, and if you want to fall asleep now, please be my guest. Um, so, the patient, the practitioner, the remedy, I think of them in terms of state functions, which we write like this and we can combine them like this. This is the PPR entangled state. This is what's happening. This is the magic moment in a homeopathic or any kind of consultation. It comes together. This is one way it can come together. There's actually eight possible ways it can come together out of this formulation. With the up arrow, it means the practitioner's being helpful. With the down arrow, it means the practitioner's unhelpful. So there's a bit of, you know, there's leeway here. The patient gets better, up well, uh, up um, arrow, the patient doesn't get better or starts off in an unwell state. The remedy is curative, up arrow, the uh, down arrow means the remedy is non-curative. I've only chosen two possible states. Obviously, there's many more, but then it gets really complicated, and I'm not, I repeat, not a mathematician. I'm a chemist, I'm thick, remember? Uh, What's interesting here, of course, is that when you read Vitorkas' book on the science of homeopathy, I think it's that one, uh, he suggests there's possibly 12 different ways that, um, that can be the out outcome of a therapeutic consultation. The fact that I've got eight from just looking at it like this, I think, well, that's interesting. There's maybe the things are moving together in some way. Okay, so this is where the geometry comes in. We look at this triadic state between the patient, practitioner, and remedy, but then each of these entities can be broken down into triadic states. So the practitioner is thinking in terms of patient, remedy, and symptoms. The patient is expressing symptoms, needs a remedy, and has got a disease. The remedy has the certain properties derived from its material substance, its own remedy, and the symptoms that it actually expresses as we observe in things like the uh, Materia Medica. Entanglement occurs when we bring these three together into this super triangle, and then we've got an extra dimension to play with. We fold that super triangle up, and hey presto, we have a tetrahedron, a state tetrahedron. Okay? You following me? Or is this completely sort of like bleh? Because sometimes when I look at it, it feels like there. <laughs> okay. So, in quantum theory, experimental observations are related via their mathematical operators and state functions and their mirror images. And this is the relationship. 
the mirror image of this entangled state, if you like, is its mirror image. We'll come to that in a moment. This represents the practitioner. You put the whole thing together and you expect a change of symptoms. So this is just a nice mathematical way of putting together what we know. Okay? So it means that the therapeutic outcome of three-way entanglement should be, could be, a change of symptoms. Now, the practitioner's role in this. What is the practitioner's role? Well, actually going back to something that Jean said, is to create a space. Now, this is where the language of quantum theory and the language of therapy, if you like, begin to co-mingle. Because the space in which quantum theory occurs is called a Hilbert space. It's a mathematical space. Well, what I'm doing is saying, well, okay, let's call that a therapeutic state space. I'm not saying it's Hilbert, whatever. The point is, what the practitioner is doing is creating that space and then operating within it. Which is weird, because it becomes a bit sort of... Well, there's certain kinds of um, religious philosophy when I think about that. Hmm. An imminent God. Well, any, don't want to go there. Okay, well, this is the picture I've come up with. There's our um, patient in the sort of like unwell state. Here's the practitioner as a mirror. We often say the practitioner mirrors the patient, but it's not a passive mirror. It's not a mirror that you go, and that's what comes back. This is a different kind of mirror. It's an active mirror. What the practitioner can do is to reflect back and then possibly as the um, the therapeutic process proceeds, begin to help the, pra the, the patient come to a point where they realize what a well state looks like. So in geometric terms, this is kind of like inverting the image that's in the mirror. Now, to get an inversion geometrically, you have to go around a Mobius strip. Do you know what a Mobius strip is? You've never done a Mobius strip? Has anyone got a bit of paper? Oh. This is something else you've got to practice during the, um, during the lunch break. Whoops. OK, piece of paper. Let's just uh, cut it in half. My origami skills are just crap. They really are. OK, piece of paper. Now, if you just join it up like that, would you agree the piece of paper has two sides? An inside and an outside. OK, if you first turn them through 180 degrees and then join them up, it only has one side. In other words, to get back to the beginning, you have to go around twice. Play with this. Kids play with this. If you've never seen this before, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> Sorry, I've made a bit of a mess here. Ooh. Maybe I've completely... Uh, Oh dear. So, PPR entanglement ena enables the creation of a therapeutic state space which mirrors the patient's journey to cure. So what the journey to cure here is, if you like, the merging of those two tetrahedra into something called a stellated octahedron. And that's the change of symptoms. This is all sort of like metaphor. And I just like playing with geometrical shapes. But it seems to make sense to me at any rate. There's another way of looking at it, which is like this. We consider the practitioner, the patient in the unwell state, and the remedy. It all comes together in the entangled moment. Then there's that magic aha moment. Let's get the words up. And then, from there, we can collapse. Now, there's a a concept I'll actually try and get your head around. There's something in quantum theory, thanks, called the collapse of the wave function. What that means is there's an observational process. When we think of subatomic particles as being like waves, when we observe that, what happens is the wave function collapses and there's a particle. So the act of observation produces the particle, which is weird because what quantum theory is saying is that by observing the universe, we bring it into existence. What a responsibility. You thought of that? Anyway, 
What I'm saying is that the randomised controlled trial is an observational procedure that collapses the wave function. Now, here, it can collapse in one of two ways. We can either get the patient better, in which case everyone goes on with their lives, or we actually go back into the process. And when you look at that as an instantaneous diagram, it looks a bit like a force field. Just does so, I don't know. Whether it is or not, I'm not sure. But it's, what I'm trying to do here is to actually step out of what we're doing on a daily basis and look at the process as a whole. And that's what it seems like to me. OK, one more thing. What about this vital force we talk about? OK? Well, it strikes me the vital force is a bit like a spinning top. Because what does the vital force do? It throws, th throws things out. Try saying that quickly with a dry mouth, throws things out, okay? That's what spinning tops do. So, um, Herring's law of cure, symptoms of disease are thrown outwards, so the action of the vital force is centrifugal, or centripetal, depending on your, how you understand the definition of the term. So it's a bit like a gyroscope. The faster it spins, it stands upright. You ever played with a gyroscope? Good, right, have you noticed how, when it's spinning really fast, you try and turn it, it resists. It's a bit like an animal. It resists. And when it's spinning there really fast, it's standing upright. You try and push it over and it bounces back immediately. But as it begins to slow down, it begins to precess like that. And then it gets easier to push over. So what I'm saying is that <clears throat> if the vital force is a bit like a spinning top, then um, its state of health depends on its rate of spin. OK? Um, so the more the vital force processes, the more sick it is, if you like, and the more symptoms it produces. Um, health state changes do not occur smoothly, however. They occur in jumps. So in that sense, it's quantized. And the picture for that is this thing here, if you like. That's a kind of like an energy profile of, say, you know, a spinning top. That's its healthy state then disease strikes and it drops into a less healthy state, which you can see has a certain amount of stability, which is what chronic disease is. It's a state maintained over time. That's what we mean by stable. <coughs> um, so we need something to actually jerk the, um, the vital force back up into a high spin state. Now, um, an aggravation in that sense could be, because think back to when you're when you were playing with spinning tops. <clears throat> Remember the type you used to whip to get to go faster? Well, it goes faster, but it wobbles like mad, and then it settles into a high spin state. So an aggrav aggravation would be similar to that, the, the wobbling after you've spun it up. Of course, what we prefer to do is to spin it up gradually. Maybe LMs are the answer to that, I don't know. OK. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> um, now, the point about this is we can't see the vital force. We can only experience the vital force via the symptoms it produces. Now, that's very similar to a quantum system. We only know about the quantum system from the observations we make of it. We can't actually experience it itself. <coughs> so, what we do is we combine... <coughs> excuse me, this quantum mechanical notion of the quantized vital force with the PPR entanglement, and we end up with this. That at the start, there's the energy level of the patient. There's, during the therapeutic process, the energy level goes up. There's the, that m marvelous aha moment. And then at the end, after decoherence, we go down to a lower energy state than here, but higher than where we started from. And that, if you like, is the energy profile of the successful therapeutic process. Uh, where are we? So, <clears throat> applying the RCT methodology, in my view, could reduce the PPR entangled state wave function to zero. And that collapse of the wave function, um, let's, let's, let's set all that. Okay. So imply, it, what it implies is that the observational stance taken during the randomized controlled trial methodology um, essentially disrupts the very thing we're trying to observe. That's my point. 
The RCT methodology disrupts the very thing we're trying to observe. And it's quite interesting that the, yeah, I'm zero, I'm out of time. Uh, the, the efficacy of substances tend to be much lower in, um, uh, in trials than what they are in real life. So the R RCT is actually taking something away from all of that. And therefore, it's not a gold standard. It's not the best thing since sliced bread. And enjoy your lunch. Thank you. We have a quick, yeah. <clears throat> Question time. Okay, very interesting. Um, Thank you. You, some, you mentioned something about similar suffering. It's uh, the key expression for homeopathic uh, treatment. And could it be that uh, during uh, the, tr the, the therapist is, is, is talking or uh, laying up a therapy for the patient, that there is some quants, I don't even know how I should express it, uh, that uh, will affect um, by his uh, empathical understanding of the patient's situation that this is like getting this extra energy or transferring the quants. Because if I... Quants? Yes. Um, quantum? Quantum. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. <laughs> I was too English. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're being too Swedish, but anyway. Do you, do you, because it's, in, even <clears throat> it's a similar suffering. Yes. Could that affect through, um, by the way how a, a practitioner is with the patient, that this is um, triggering the health process? Yes, is a simple answer to what you've just said. <clears throat> but... Um, Having done this now for the last 10 or 15 years, I have to admit to you, I'm getting a little bit sick of it. And the reason why I'm getting sick of it is because what I seem to have done is to have contradicted what Harnon said right at the very beginning, is to not make a huge big thing of it, just get in there and do it. Um, for me, it's been an incredible journey to actually try and make those connections. But let's not get lost in those connections. You know why you do homeopathy, <laughs> don't you? Does anyone not know why they do homeopathy here? You never know. <laughs> There's an honest man. But there, you're right, something happens, it's that ah. And that ah comes from a deep well of all sorts of stuff, your own experience. Got to be careful there. If your own experience has been sort of tough, it's very, very easy to then get lost in that and project that onto the patient. This is why the, uh, what's that thing about the um, unprejudiced observer? You have to deal with that. If it comes up and it's in your face, you have to deal with that and not project it. But you're right, and that's all the stuff that goes on. I don't think it's dealt with with that, but on the other hand, we're sort of like, it's part of it. Thank you, thank you very much, Lionel, uh, for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to make a, a small remark regarding RCTs, because I think it's important that we make a differentiation between blind that placebo-controlled RCTs and pragmatic RCTs. Pragmatic RCTs can absolutely test the effectiveness of treatment and the whole entanglement can be kept within the trial. So it's just to make that distinction, I think <clears throat> it might be confusing to some if they then see a pragmatic RCT and they're going to think, oh, right. this is trying to do gold standard efficacy trial, but it's not. It's trying to test the effectiveness of uh, treatment modality and it's actually one of the very best ways of doing it. Thank you, Peta, for putting me straight. <laughs> ah, Mr. Journalist. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, I'm a do medical doctor, and you had a little bit negative attitude to placebo. Uh, I'm also a research worker involved in research con related to placebo, and in our mind, or working with Mrs. Karolinska, placebo exists. The problem is, what is, how does it work? B because it does work. Placebo is a, is a reality, and not something that you can describe as we believe in and take it as a something. Um, yes. Um, it's there. It's there, and it was there from the very early days when they were giving oh, no. saltwater solutions we instead of cocaine it's or and today morphine. We know it. and today, the problem is, how does it work? 
Well, that's interesting because the question, how does it work, comes from a basis of something existing out there separate from us, whether we exist or not. I think we're all involved in how it works. I don't know if that answers your question, it probably doesn't. But this is the problem with science at the moment, that uh, on the one hand, there is this uh, strong objectivity, that there's something is out there waiting for to be discovered, as my T-shirt says, or we are actually involved in the creation of the universe, and I'm afraid the quantum theory, the quantum mechanics is against you. We are involved in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lionel Milgram. Thank you.